Good morning. It's great to see everybody. So glad we can worship God together this morning. Our theme for 2024 is growing more in 2024, and we're looking at ways we can grow down, that is, grow more deeper into different fundamental areas of our faith and our Christian walk. We're going to be looking at growing up into maturity and then growing out in evangelism and reaching out to others. And as we're still looking at growing down, today we're going to look at growing more in love, growing more in love. I hope you'll turn in your Bibles to that passage that was read for us from 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and there's a couple of things I'd like to mention about that passage before we move on and look at what love is, how important it is, and how some things we can do and keep in mind to grow in love. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9. Uh, start in verse 9, where the Apostle, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes, But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Now, the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit had no problem setting things in order in churches that were out of whack, that needed to be fixed. But Paul says here, this is something that they didn't need, he didn't really need to write any more about, because they had learned from God himself how to love one another. And that's important. That's going to come back later, that it's God who teaches us what love really is. He says in verse 10, And indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. So think about, just for a second, what exactly the Bible is saying there. Paul is saying, I have no need to write to you on this topic, because God has taught you how to do it. But I do pray that you will increase more and more. And really the implication for us is there's never a place where we arrive when it comes to love. We never get to a point where we say, well, we've loved enough. We can kind of retire from love. We don't have to do this anymore. This is not a thing that we have to keep working on. Paul's saying, even if you have enough to the point where I don't have to write to you about it, I pray that you can increase more and more. Now, for some of us, that might be a little bit um, intimidating, right? That there's always room for improvement. But really, that's a blessing. It speaks to the grace and love of God, that he's still working on us, and that we can change, and we can grow, and we can improve, and we can become more like Jesus. And that's our goal this morning, as we look at growing more in love. Before we get into this, we have to ask ourselves, really, what is love? What is love? Of course, there's a famous song that asks that question. We won't be repeating that here. But the question really is, what is love? Because... If we have a wrong idea of love and we're trying to grow in a wrong idea of love, we're going to do ourselves some damage. We're going to do ourselves, uh, get ourselves in some bad situations. Think about with me just for a second, how do we often use that word love? How do we often use that word love? We might tell our, you know, our husband or our wife, I love you. We might tell our children or our parents, I love you. And that's probably the purest way we use that word. We're saying, hey, my love for you is it's transcendent upon any contingencies, even if you disappoint me, even if you upset me, even if whatever, I have this commitment to you. And that's what we're expressing when we say that. But think about how we use it other times, right? If you, if you love a restaurant, what does that mean? What did that restaurant do for you other than maybe give you some food that didn't make you sick, that tasted good? Maybe they had good service. We say, we, we, I love that restaurant. What are we saying? Man, I really like the... The ambiance in there. When I go in there for a meal, I feel welcomed. Man, I love that restaurant. We might say we love a car. We might say we love a TV show. And unfortunately, when we use love that way, what we're saying is this thing makes me feel good. And we're saying because this thing makes me feel good, I can say that I love it. And the problem comes when we apply that word, that way of using love to people. And we say, when I say I love this person, what I'm saying is they make me feel good. And the problem with that is, what happens if that person stops making us feel good? Then we have to stop loving them, if that's our definition of love. And how can I love my enemies if love means this person makes me feel good? How can I love my children if that means this person makes me feel good? Sometimes our children don't make us feel good. How can I love my spouse if I say what I mean by that is this person makes me feel good? Sometimes our spouses won't make us feel good. In the New Testament, love is much more than just a feeling that we get. One lexicon describes it or defines it. The, the Greek word most often used for love, the one, the love we're supposed to have for one another, agape, you've probably heard that term before. It's esteem and goodwill toward another expressed in words and deeds. So it's not just a feeling that I have. It's not just, you know, a warm fuzzy 
It is something that is expressed in what I do and what I say. And notice it starts with esteem. I respect you enough. I value enough. I value you enough to do something for you, to say something good to you. And it has goodwill toward another person. I want you to prosper objectively. I want what's best for you objectively to happen to you. That's the, the Bible's definition of love. I put it another way, it's a generous love full of thoughtfulness and concern. So it's not just, well, hey, you scratch my back, I can scratch yours, you make me feel good, so I'm going to say that I love you. I said I'm really spending some time thinking about, because I'm concerned for you, I'm thinking about what would be best for you and what could I do to help you get there. That's the kind of love that God has for us. And that's the kind of love that God is calling us to. Perhaps no place in the Bible gives us insight into what love is more than 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as far as what we're expected to demonstrate when we say we love somebody. I hope you'll turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as we read verses 4 through 7. We'll read verses 1 through 3 later in this lesson, but notice verses 4 through 7. This is a passage that's often read at weddings, for example. Nothing wrong with that. But in the context, the Bible is not talking about a husband and a wife. The Bible is simply talking about any Christian and his love for any other person. And, and the context is that in Corinth, they were fighting over these spiritual gifts. By the, um, by the laying on of the apostles' hands, they were able to speak in tongues. They were able to miraculously heal. They were able to uh, have supernatural knowledge. They didn't have to study the Bible. They just knew God's will, some of them. All these different things. And they were fighting with each other. Hey, my gift is better than your gift. No, my gift is better than your gift. Hey, I deserve to get up and speak in church. No, you don't. I should be speaking in church. And Paul has to remind them the most important thing in the Christian life is not these gifts. It's not our talents. It's not our abilities. But it's love, the love we have for one another. And he even tells them at the end of chapter 13 that these gifts will be done away with when the perfect or the complete comes, but love will abide forever. But notice what love is. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. Some translations say it keeps no records of wrongs. It does not rejoice in iniquity or in sin, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. In other words, love is patient. It's kind. It's not envious. If you love somebody and they succeed, you're not mad at them. You don't wish you got what they got. You're happy for them. It's not prideful. I love you so much, I'm going to make sure that I force my will on you. That's not love. That's something else. It's not rude hey, I love you so much, I'm going to make sure we do it my way with no consideration of what you would like. It's, it's selfless. It does not insist on its own way. It's forgiving. I'm not keeping records of wrongs. It is truth honoring. If I love somebody and they're walking in sin and not in the truth, out of love, I'm going to help them to come back to the truth. It is enduring. That's what the Bible says. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures. True love does endure all things. So that's our starting point. With that understanding of love in mind, let's consider the importance of love also. As we consider that love is primarily about actions and not feelings. It's something we do, not just something we feel in our heart. And that leads us to the importance of love. How important is love? To help us grow in love, we must remember how important it is. And Now, some of us might be listening to this and think, well, I know love's important. Of course it is. I've felt it. I've extended it to others. This is something... Um, that I don't need a reminder about. But in the life of the Christian, we must always be reminded that love is not an optional thing. It's not an add-on. You know, if you go buy a car, or really almost anything these days, there's all these subscription services, and there's kind of like the base price. You know, there's like the $10 version, but for an extra $2.99 a month, you could get the add-on package with additional features. Maybe you go buy a car. You know, there's the base version. There's the base trim of the car. And then if you want a steering wheel, that's another $1,000. If you want lug nuts, that's another $2,000, right? The add-ons come on pretty quick. Sometimes I'm afraid that maybe nobody in this room, but maybe some people out there, we might think that Christianity comes, and there's kind of this base package of Christianity. And I can kind of pay, like, the minimum monthly payment and be a Christian, and then maybe, you know, I could save up enough energy or time or resources, and then I could get the add-on package of Christianity. And love really comes in one of these add-on packages. Like, I'm just trying to read my Bible and come to church 
and pray and, you know, that's kind of it. And then love would be like a next thing I can add on. But love is part of, well, one, Christianity doesn't work that way. And two, love is, is the basic package. Love is really in some ways, I don't want to overstate it, but love is almost everything. And we're going to see that when we look in the Bible. Consider Jesus in Matthew 22 and what he says when he is, when he is tested by some lawyers And they ask him a question that a lot of people had in his day, and that is, what's the greatest commandment? Hey, we've got 600-something commandments in the Old Testament. Wouldn't it be great to kind of organize these in order of importance? Which one's the greatest one? And in Matthew 22, 34, when they come and ask him this question, hey, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? We see Jesus' response in verses 37 through 40. And Jesus says to this lawyer, this is the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 5. And then he says, he says this is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, quoting Leviticus 19, verse 18. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What he's saying? What is he saying? These two, really, everything else depends on this. Everything God has ever commanded anybody comes down to this. How important is love in Christianity? Jesus said in John 13 that this is the way that people will know that you follow me. John 13, 35 through 36. Your love for one another. Again, it's not a feeling in your stomach. It's what we do and why we do it. We see the importance of love again in 1 Corinthians 13. Notice this is beginning in verse number 1. Where the apostle says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels... But have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Again, they were fighting over these gifts, one of which was speaking in tongues. That word just means languages. He says, I could speak in every tongue, every language. And if I do it without love, it's nothing. It's a cacophony. It's, it's just noise. He says, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have faith so that I could remove mountains. You could, you could be the number one scholar. You could know everything the Bible has to say. And if I don't have love, Paul says, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. And you say, man, well, that, that, that's, if you love somebody, right? Isn't that what you would do? Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. And though I give my body to be burned. He says, even if I'm a martyr, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Think about that for a second. Paul's saying the greatest acts of religious service, the greatest acts of faith, the greatest gifts I could have from God, if I use them, if I operate them, if I involve myself in them without love, without the right motivation, without getting the first thing first, it's nothing, it's vain, it is meaningless. Love is, in many ways, what defines the Christian life. And it makes sense if you know what a Christian is. What is a Christian? What does Christian mean? It means you're a follower of Christ. Well, who was Christ? Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross. Why? Out of love for all of mankind. Why did Jesus come to earth? He came to reveal the Father. Well, who is the Father? The true God, the maker of heaven and earth, the God who is love. That's who Jesus Christ came to reveal. So to think that somehow I could follow him and I don't need to give up anything for anybody else and I don't need to have goodwill and esteem other people and sacrifice for other people out of my love for them, I have put the cart before the horse. There's a story, and you know, it's a preacher's story, so who knows if it's true or not. But there's a story about a woman who went on vacation, a woman and her family went on vacation to Pennsylvania. And they're going through Pennsylvania and you know, they're, they're in Amish country. And they're looking at the rocking chairs and they're eating the cheese and doing all the things you do when you're in Amish country and they're traveling around. And she didn't know very much about the Amish. She didn't understand who they were, why they were there, why they were dressed that way. And they're driving down the road and they pull up next to those carriages with the Amish man, you know, with his horses. And she pulls up next to them and she had a question and she said, sir, are you a Christian? And she's thinking, you know, what, is this a religious sect? What is this? Sir, are you a Christian? And the story goes that the Amish man looked at her and said, you'll have to ask my neighbor. Why did he say that? Now, Christianity certainly is more than love for neighbor, but it can never be less than love for neighbor. When Jesus said the two greatest commandments were to love God and to love his neighbor, I think he really meant that. 
Now that Amish man, who knows whether he said that or not, but I think that it's interesting. What if that's the perception through which we viewed Christianity? And sure, I can jump through the right hoop. Sure, I can believe all the right things, but if I'm not keeping the two greatest commandments, what's the worth of it? I think he understood that, and I hope that that's something we understand as well. God's most important command is love. In fact, Paul would say in Romans 13, verse number 9, Oh, no one anything but to love your neighbor, because he who loves fulfills the law. And this is why all of God's law can be summed up as this, the command to love. With the importance of love in mind, let's consider real quick our model for love before we get into some practicalities. Our model for love. It makes sense that if love for others is so vital to the life of a Christian, that God would teach us how to do it. We all know there's different ways to learn something. Right? Some of us are very good learners, uh, how do they say it, um, visually, right? I, show me a diagram, and then if I can see the diagram, maybe I can learn it or figure it out. Some of us are good learners from hearing, right? Hey, if, if you give me a lecture, or if you give me a speech, or if you explain it to me, then I can figure it out. But you know, the best way, perhaps the quickest way to teach somebody something is to show it to them. And maybe I'm just biased. That's the way I learn the best. Like, hey, you can explain it to me until you're blue in the face. You could draw me a diagram. I don't, you know, do I have it? Is this upside down? How do I know? Um, but if you show me how to do it, then all of a sudden things start to click. And when God wanted to teach us love, he didn't just shout from heaven, hey, love each other. When God wanted to teach us how to love, he showed us how to do it. And he showed us how to do it through his son, Jesus. Consider Jesus' words in John 15, verses 13 through 14 where he says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. What's Jesus saying? The greatest love one could possibly have is this, to lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus didn't just say that to teach it, right? Just a couple chapters later, when you read the book of John, he is on the cross, literally, laying down his life for his friends. He's showing them how to do it. He's showing them what it looks like to love. Notice also what we see in 1 John 3, verse 16, where the Bible tells us, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. We wouldn't know what love really was if Jesus never died on the cross. We'd be kind of stuck in this gray area where we're like, well, we really care for somebody, but we're not willing to sacrifice for them, but they make us feel good, so I guess we love them. But the Bible says this is how we know it, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our life for the brethren. What is he saying? Jesus teaches us what it looks like, what it means to love somebody. It requires sacrifice. He's not just our model. He's our motivation. Consider with me 1 John chapter 4. And notice beginning in verse number 7, what the Bible records for us there, where Christians are commanded, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. How do we know love? How do we learn love? We have to learn it from God. There's no other way. And if we keep reading in this passage, in this the love of God was manifested toward us. It was demonstrated. It was shown to us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of for our sins. We didn't burden God with, hey, we love you so much, you have to do something for us. God extended first by sending Jesus to die for our sins. I love verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Notice that we move from that God has shown us what love is to being motivated to love there in verse number 11. If God has shown us this is how we love, if God has shown us love, we ought to moral necessity. We need to show this love to other people. God demonstrates not only how to love, but he gives us the model and the motivation to love others with that same love. I think part of what the Bible's saying here is similar to, have you ever been through a drive through line? I know nobody here eats fast food, but if you've ever gone through a drive through line, sometimes they start doing this thing, they call it paying it forward. Have you ever been caught in one of those? I mean, uh, ever been in one of those? You know, and, and there's some kind soul who gets up there, and he doesn't only pay for his own meal, he pays for the person behind him. 
And then that next person gets up, and they're so full of the charity of the person in front of them that they say, you know what, instead of getting a free meal, I want to pay for the person behind me. And that person gets up to the line and so motivated and encouraged by the two people in front of him, he says, you know what, I don't want a free meal. I want to pay for the person behind me. And then you pull up there, and though you ordered $6 worth of stuff, your bill is $45 if you want to pay it forward. (laughs) Some of you have been there. I know I've been there. And now you say, well, what do I do? Right? I I just wanted a cheap thing off the dollar menu. (laughs) It could put you in a sticky situation. But let's think about it in this terms. When it comes to love, when we love another person as a Christian, what are we doing? You know what we're doing is we're paying it forward. We're not saying, you know, I'm such a good person that just out of the kindness of my heart, I wanted to do this for you. No. When it comes to love, Christians are paying it forward. You know, we owed a bill that we could not pay. And Jesus Christ, who owed absolutely nothing, Jesus Christ paid that bill on our behalf. So now what are we doing? We're in the world. And we're helping others pay their metaphorical bills. Sometimes maybe even literally, right? Jesus owed us nothing. He paid our tab. And now, motivated by his love, we're going forward, and we're paying it forward, and we're showing that love to other people. We can even love horrible people. Why? Because God loved me when I was a horrible person. And if we ever forget that and come to this place where, you know, I've earned the love of God, God should love me, then it's going to be really hard to pay it forward to other people. But if we're like that person in the drive through line, who ordered $250 worth of stuff and somebody else picked up the tab, the least we could do is pay it forward. When we think about our model for love, we realize that Jesus is our model and our motivation for loving others. He's the one who teaches us how to do it. If we want to grow in love, we got to spend some time remembering Jesus, looking at Jesus, reading about Jesus, thinking about Jesus, meditating on Jesus. I think that's part of, not the whole reason why, but I do think that's part of why we celebrate the Lord's Supper every single first day of the week. It's not just remembering a death, it's remembering why that death occurred. And that death occurred because God loves us, really, that much. So as we consider some help to grow our love, some help to grow our love, some principles for us to take home with us, to grow in love this week and hopefully beyond, the first thing we can do to help grow our love is to meditate on God's love for us. If you want to grow in love, it's going to start here, to meditate on God's love for you. Think about what 1 John 4, verse 11 says. If God has loved us, we ought to love one another. Right? If God has so loved us, we ought to love one another. What's the Bible saying? If we meditate on God's love, if we understand it, if we dwell on it, if it gets into our hearts, not just our minds, but into our hearts, and then that's our model for love. That's our motivation for love for other people. And there's going to be times when we're too tired to do something out of love for somebody. And we can think about, I wonder how tired Jesus was when he was walking up that hill with that cross nailed to his back. There's going to be times where it seems like it's too expensive to love others. And we're going to say, man, how much did God pay to buy me back? There's going to be times where it's too inconvenient to love other people. And we're going to be able to stop and think, how convenient was it for Jesus? To leave heaven, to come to earth, to be a man, to live the life he lived, to die the death he died. We're going to say it's too hard to love somebody else. And we say, I'm sure it wasn't easy for Jesus Christ when he demonstrated his love for us. And I'm I'm not trying to guilt trip you into loving other people, but I am trying to get us to think about what God has already done for us and to try to extend that to other people. To grow in love, we need to meditate on God's love for us. Next, we need to remember who others are. We need to remember who others are. We read in 1 John 4, verses 20 through 21, If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this is the commandment we have from him, He who loves God must love his brother also. Why did Jesus, when he was asked what the greatest commandment was, he gave two? It's because you can't separate those commandments. You have to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the most important one. Without it, nothing else makes sense. But a second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Why is that like loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? 
Part of why loving my neighbor is like loving my God is because my neighbor was made in the image of my God. He bears his image. He bears his likeness. Our neighbor is a special creation made by God to spend eternity with him. Your enemy is a special creation made by God to spend eternity with him. The person you hate the most is made in the image of God. And as we read in James chapter 3, bears his similitude. Brothers and sisters, sometimes we fail to love as we should because we forget the true identity of the people around us. We start to label them. You know, they're they're those people who do those things. And they stop becoming people who are so loved by the same God who loves us. They stop becoming people who who are made in the image of God and loved by the God who loves us. When we are quick to judge, quick quick to condemn, quick to generalize, quick to write off, quick to ignore, quick to exact, quick to snap, slow to forgive, slow to pardon, slow to help, slow to sacrifice, slow to give, it's because we've forgotten God's love for us and we've forgotten who other people really are. They're made in the image of God, the same God who's loved us at great cost to himself. To grow in love, another thing we can do is do something for the least. Do something for the least. In Matthew chapter 25, we're we're given three parables, the last of which is an image, an image of God, uh, really Jesus Christ in judgment, sitting on his throne to judge the world. It says all nations are gathered before him. They're separated into the sheep and the goats. And to those who are on his right, the sheep, he invites into the everlasting kingdom of his father. And he says, because I was naked and you clothed me, I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. He says, I was in prison and you visited me, I was sick and you helped me. And of course they say, well, Lord, when did we see you do all these things? When did we help you? And he says, as much as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And the goats, he says, depart from me, go into uh, that place of fire, hell, prepared for the devil and his angels because... I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was naked, I was in prison, I was sick, you didn't help me at all. They say, Lord, when did we ignore you? He said, as much as you ignored the least of these, my brethren, you ignored me. Brothers and sisters, we are surrounded by people. There are even people in this congregation that we could describe as the least of these, our brethren. The people who are sick, the people who are shut in, the people who are poor, the people who can't afford clothing. The people, we could go through the list, the people that if you were to have somebody over for dinner, they would be the last person you would invite. Jesus would say that's the very first person who needs to be there. The person who sits by themselves in the fellowship meal. Those are the people, brothers and sisters, by which our love really will be tested. Everybody loves their friends. Everybody loves their family. Everybody loves the people who do something for them that are easy to be around, that don't need anything. Everybody loves those people. The true test of whether or not we fall in love with the heart of Jesus, the true test of whether or not we really love God our Father, is how do we treat the people we don't want to be around? How do we treat the people that inconvenience us, that burden us, that pain us, that cost us? How do we treat those people? Brothers and sisters, we can do something for the least of these today. Grab your directory. Go through the Rolodex of your mind. Open your eyes and look around. There are people who are ignored. Unfortunately, sometimes even in the church, Those are the people that we really need to be doing something for. In the next place, if we're going to grow in our love, we need to put ourselves in another's shoes. In Luke chapter 10, we get what's often called the parable of the Good Samaritan. The priest and the Levite, two religious people traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho or vice versa, they see this man who was beat up, stolen from, left for dead, barely hanging on to life, and they pass by on the other side. They had things to do. They were busy. And then here comes this Samaritan, this dog, this half-breed, somebody on which, down, uh, somebody upon which the priest and the Levite likely would have looked down themselves. And in Luke 10, verse 33, this detail is given to us. What's the difference between the Samaritan, the priest, and the Levite? We might say, well, the Samaritan's a good person. The other ones aren't. Maybe. They're on the same road. They're seeing the same guy. They're going to the same place. What's the difference between the priest, the Levite, And the Samaritan, Jesus gives us the difference in Luke 10, verse 33. He gives us one little detail. Something the Samaritan had that the priest and the Levite did not have. Compassion. 
When the Samaritan saw that man on the side of the road, he did not see a man on the side of the road. When the Samaritan saw that man on the side of the road, the Samaritan saw himself. And he said, what if I was beaten, bloodied, naked, and left for dead? What would I want somebody to do for me? What if I fell into that misfortune? What if that was me? Every breath paining me, hanging on for dear life on the side of the road, ignored already. What if I was there? That's what compassion is, to put ourselves in another's shoes, to feel sympathy, to have the pain felt by another, felt by us, and that rousing us to action. What's the difference between the Samaritan, the priest, and the Levite? The Samaritan had compassion. Brothers and sisters, when we see somebody, when we see somebody who needs help, let's put ourselves in their shoes. It's hard to love people when you're looking down your nose. But it becomes a lot easier when you're walking in their shoes. That's the Samaritan. That's what he did. May we go and do likewise, just as Jesus commanded. In the next place, if we're going to grow in love, we need to not hoard, but help. We need to not hoard, but help. We read in 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, right on the heels of verse 16, which we already read. This is how we know love. Jesus Christ gave his life for us. We should give our life for the brethren. And the text continues on, and it says in verse 17, But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, I know you need help, I'm not going to help you. How does the love of God abide in him? It doesn't. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. The Bible saying, don't just tell somebody you love them, show them. Amen. And by this we know that we are of the truth, and we shall assure our hearts before him. How do you know you're walking in truth? When you have something that could help somebody, instead of keeping it for yourself, you really do help them. You demonstrate your love for them, not just with your words, but with your actions. Maybe you can think of somebody or something right now. Why do we do that? Why do we close our heart to people who need something we could give them? I think part of it is we forget why God blesses us. Why does God bless us? Does God bless us so that we can have bigger stuff, better stuff? Nothing wrong with that, but is that the purpose of God's blessing? Or does God bless us so that we can be a blessing to other people? In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 8, the Bible records how those who give liberally to the needs of the saints, that God will provide for them in abundance for every good work. Out of love, God blesses you so that you can bless another person and therefore store up treasure in heaven. Sometimes we fail to love because we fail to remember that the things we have actually don't belong to us. They belong to God. And one day we will die, and we'll leave them behind, and we'll go to meet him. And it's true, the only things you can take with you are the things you use to help others here in this life. Lastly, if we want to grow in love, we should remember this. If you want to be loved, love. Sometimes it's hard to love other people because we feel like other people don't love us. And we say, how can I do something for somebody who doesn't care about me? How can I do something for somebody who ignores me? How can I do something? For somebody who doesn't even know that I exist, and I think that we are giving, given a little bit of a hint here in Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 24. And Proverbs 18, verse 24 tells us, a man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. A man who has friends himself must be friendly, but a, there is a friend who sticks closer than a, butter, a brother. If we want to be loved, we need to love. That's what God did. He didn't say, I want you to love me so much, I'm going to wait until you love me, and then I'll love you back. That's not what God did. God said, I want you to love me. That's my greatest command. I want you to love me, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to love you first. Brothers and sisters, may we do likewise. Not worrying, well, what if they don't love me back? What if they don't whatever? I don't receive any love. Why should I give any love? Maybe we need to act friendlier. Maybe we need to act with more love. Think about Jesus. That's what Jesus did. Jesus wants to be your friend. Jesus wants to be your friend. He wants you to consider him as a friend. What did he do in order to make you his friend? He died on the cross. He says, that's the greatest love a man has, to die for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I tell you, brothers and sisters, Jesus loves you. May we love him back. It's really hard to grow in love when we don't know the love of God, and that's where it starts. If we're going to grow more in love, we have to be familiar with the greatest love that's ever been shown, and that's Jesus Christ on the cross, dying 
not for his sins, not for his transgressions, not for his crimes, dying for ours, for us, so that we can be forgiven. God, loving his enemies to the point that he's willing to send his own son to die for them, to atone for them, so that he can have a relationship with us, brothers and sisters, don't let that grow dull for you. Don't let that grow unimpressive for you. That's the love that not only has changed the world and can change the world, but that's the love that can change your life. And if you react to that love by giving love back to God, by obeying his commandments, like Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, then you can start to show that love to other people. God, help us to do just that. God has loved us so much. I hope that you can be filled with that love and that you can show it to other people. Maybe you need help. Maybe you need to repent. Maybe you want to know the love of God and you don't know where to start. We would love to help you. Maybe you are ready to accept Jesus' loving invitation to be a part of his fold, to be his friend, to do what he's commanded you. You can come forward in faith today, repenting of your sins, confessing his name, being buried with him in baptism, to know for a fact Jesus is your friend. He died for you, and now you know you're his friend because... You're living for him. If you want to start that today or get right back on track, I hope you will, while we stand and sing this song.